when uh, people are brand new here to Life Journey and just starting to get to know me, they will sometimes refer to me as Reverend Minor. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Reverend. As if anyone deserves to be reverenced, which of course I do, but <laughs> it is kind of an awkward statement, isn't it? The only person I expect to refer to me as reverend is my spouse at home. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> As people get to know me better and our church culture better, they realize that we're not much for formality, and so they'll start to refer to me by a less formal title like Pastor Jeff, that's better. But as they come to know me even more, they'll get to that place where they're comfortable just saying Jeff, which I prefer because we're all fellow travelers on this journey of life, and there is no hierarchy in Jesus' community. And then there are those who get to know me so well that they become part of my inner circle and eventually learn and use my secret nickname, Pastor Pookie. <laughs> Do not call me that. <laughs> or I will have to kill you. Do you understand? <laughs> My point is simply that when we first are getting to know someone, we tend to address them in more formal ways. As we get to know them better, we address them in more familiar ways. And if we become really close to them, we'll end up referring to them in intimate ways. For example, you who are married at home, do you have a special pet name that you use for your spouse? Would you like to share with us? Okay, that's a bit awkward. How about your cat or your dog? Your cat or your dog has a formal name, right? But I'll bet you rarely call your cat or dog by the way. You have some cutesy little nickname, right? Somebody tell me, what's the cutesy nickname for your cat or dog? Twiggy, woo -hoo. What? Twiggy, wiggy, woohoo. Twiggy, wiggy, woohoo. I call it pig. Pig? Fig. 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 Mm hmm. Bojo, Mojo, Clojo, something like that. <laughs> yeah, if you're on Facebook, you know about David's nickname for our cat. So, here's the point. We often get a really important clue as to how close someone is to someone else by their manner of addressing <clears throat> that person. Craig... Groeschel, excuse me, <coughs> Craig Groeschel suggests that the same is true for us and God. He says, tell me how you typically address God in prayer, and I will tell you how close or not you are to God. That's an interesting thought. So let's explore that today. Let me remind us that we're in the midst of a sermon series called Jesus, Light of the World, where we're looking at some of the core principles that Jesus came to teach us, his disciples, so that we can anchor ourselves in the abundant life that Jesus wants for us. We've looked at, for example, what Jesus meant when he said, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven unless you do so humbly like a child. And then we looked at what Jesus meant by, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Last week, we looked at Jesus' concept that life is given to us as a sacred trust. And now, today, we're going to explore a revolutionary new way that Jesus taught us to think about and relate to God, a way so revolutionary that scholars tell us Jesus' contemporaries were scandalized by it, shocked by it. What is it? Let's say a prayer, then we'll dig in. Jesus, light of the world, you came into the world to love us, to teach us, ultimately to die for us. You are our Savior. You are our master teacher, and we are your students. Teach us your truth so we can live in that truth. We ask in your holy name, 
a man. Amen. In the Old Testament, when God was on the sacred mountain, the Israelites were warned, Exodus 19, 12, be careful not to go up the mountain or even to touch the edge of it. Any who touch the mountain shall be put to death. Verse 16, there was thunder and lightning as well as a thick cloud on the mountain and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people trembled. Moses brought the people trembling out of the camp to meet God. Verse 18, the whole mountain shook violently. Moses would speak and God would answer in thunder. There, in a nutshell, you have the primary Old Testament understanding of God. God as king of the cosmos. God as master of the universe. God as the one who is entitled to lay down the laws and enforce the laws. God as judge. Don't you dare get out of line or you might just be struck down. Many of us, consciously or subconsciously, have learned to live in the center of that Old Testament understanding of God. One afternoon, a, a priest and uh, his good friend were, were out playing a round of golf. Three holes into the golf course on the putting green, the priest's friend missed a simple putt. Reflexively, he shouted, oh, shoot, I missed, except he used a much stronger word for shoot. The priest was aghast and said, Joe, I warn you, if you keep using that language, God will get you. Several holes later, sure enough, Joe misses another putt. Oh, shoot, he shouts even more profanely this time. I missed. Once again, the priest said, I'm warning you, you keep this up, and God is going to get you. The 18th hole, it has come down to this. It's all tied up, and Joe misses another simple putt. Oh, shoot, I missed. That's it, the priest said, I warned you. And with that, a bolt of lightning shot out of the sky and killed the priest. <laughs> Followed by a booming voice from the heavens that said, oh, shoot, I missed. <laughs> what did <it> really say? <laughs> Many of us consciously or subconsciously have learned to see God in that way as an angry judge, king of the universe, do me homage, bow down before me, get out of line and I'll whack you. In Jesus' culture, that was the principal lens through which people were seeing God. It was so deeply ingrained. God as enforcer, God as punisher, God as judge. It was so deeply ingrained that faithful people in Jesus' culture were taught when they walked past a disabled person to say aloud, praise be to the reliable judge. The implication being that God did it to that person because of their sins or the sins of their parents. Thankfully, Jesus expressly repudiates that perspective in Luke 19 and John chapter 11. But my point is, that view of God as punisher was so deeply ingrained in the people of Jesus' culture. And please don't get me wrong. God is king of the cosmos. Amen. God is the one who is able and worthy to judge us. So let me say it again, because I'm not discounting God as king, or God as judge, or God as unfathomable. And I suppose it's appropriate that as ancient humans were first getting to know God, that they began with God in God's formal role as king and judge. But the more you get to know somebody, the deeper the understanding and the intimacy ought to become over the course of time. 
If you know me only in my formal role as reverend, as ruler of the church in my dreams, if you know me only as the one around whom you dare not cuss lest you be struck by lightning, then your relationship with me is going to be one of distance and fear. But if over the course of time you know me not just in my formal role as ruler of the church, but you get to know me as fellow traveler and friend, As we journey life together, we then begin to build a relationship of comfort, love, and trust. In Old Testament times, people were so fixated on God as king and judge, they struggled to develop relationship with God. But then, in the fullness of time, When we humans were finally ready for something deeper, something more well-rounded, Jesus came into the world. A well-known theologian and scholar, Joachim Jeremiah, in his book, uh, New Testament Theology, he sums it up this way. Jesus came bringing good news. At the heart of that good news was a new relationship to God. The most important characteristic of the new life Jesus calls us to, more important than anything else, is a new relationship to God. In the Gospels too, Jeremiah acknowledges, reverence and hesitation form the basis of the human relationship with God. It's the introduction, it's the beginning point, God's formal role. God is the one who's utterly unfathomable. Reverence before God, the unconditional Lord, is an essential part of the Gospel. But it's not the center of the gospel. At the center of the gospel is a new way of seeing God, reflected in many gospel passages, including the scripture you just heard Ernest read for us a few moments ago. Mark chapter 14. Jesus has just finished the last supper with the disciples when he makes his way to the garden of Gethsemane. He knows what lies ahead of him, arrest and crucifixion. So he's come to the garden to center himself in prayer, to steal himself for what is about to come. We're told in Mark 14, 35 that Jesus threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him he said Abba father for you all things are possible remove this cup from me yet not what I want but what you want note if you will please the particular word that Jesus uses in this prayer to address God Abba Abba is an old Aramaic word Aramaic was Jesus native language Jesus preached and taught and interacted with the people around him in the language of Aramaic. Mark wrote his gospel in Greek. So Mark is translating Jesus from Aramaic into Greek. But when Mark records this prayer that Jesus prayed in Gethsemane for us, he feels led by the Spirit to retain, rather than translating, the original Aramaic word that Jesus used to address God there, Abba. In fact, scholars tell us that Abba is the word they believe that underlies every one of Jesus' prayers in the Gospels, save one when Jesus was on the cross and cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every other time when a prayer of Jesus is recorded in the gospel, scholars believe that the Aramaic word that he used to address God was Abba. Linguists tell us that that word Abba originated in the babblings of little children. Picture a little child in a, in a crib, just learning to talk, learning to make sounds. Abba, 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 Abba. And over time in Aramaic culture, that babel becomes the first word the child uses to refer to a beloved father. Abba, Abba, Abba. The closest English equivalent would be Dada or Daddy or maybe Papa. Linguists tell us that with time, 
Abba became the go-to term of endearment that Aramaic children of all ages, including adult children, would use to refer to a beloved father. Abba is a relational term. Master of the universe, king of the cosmos. Those are formal role-based terms for God. Beautiful and exalted, but they're not relational. Abba is a relational term. Abba is an intimate way of referring to God. And guess what? Jesus didn't just use that word when he addressed God. He taught us, his disciples, that we should do the same. So that in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus gives us that prayer called the Lord's Prayer, when he's teaching us how to pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, he says, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The underlying Aramaic word that Jesus used there, Abba. Our Abba who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This intimate way of referring to God would have shocked Jesus' contemporaries. Watch out for the lightning bolt if you dare to refer to God in such a familiar intimate, informal way. Jeremiah sums it up this way. It would have seemed disrespectful, indeed unthinkable to the sensibilities of Jesus' contemporaries to address God with this familiar word. Yet Jesus dared to use Abba as a form of address to God. So what's the point? In what ways was Jesus trying to challenge us to change and grow how we think about and relate to God. I want to highlight three key points today, three key ways that relating to God as Abba challenge us to fundamentally reconfigure our understanding, our thinking about God. Oh, and by the way, a brief aside, the word Abba is the emphasis in the word Abba is not on gender differentiation. The point of the word Abba is not that God is somehow more male than female, more father than mother. The point of the term is that God is like the most loving parent you can imagine. The Bible teaches us in Genesis 1 that God created man and woman in God's image. They were created. We need both male and female for the fullness of God's image. And so elsewhere in the Bible, for example, Isaiah refers to God as being like a mother who bounces us on her knee. And, and elsewhere, the Bible refers to God as being like a mother eagle who teaches her young to fly. So the point here is not gender-based. The point is helping us to understand that God relates to us like the most loving parent that we can imagine. What are the implications of that? For starters, it means that when I fail, God responds with mercy. Forget the thunder and the lightning. Stop trembling in your boots. When you mess up, God responds to you like the most loving parent imaginable would. True story. When, uh, when Anne Graham Lutz, one of Billy Graham's daughters, was just 17 years old and had a newly minted driver's license, she was quite confident in her driving skills, as most 17-year-olds are, and so she was going a bit too fast down the North Carolina mountain road that led from their home one day when she rounded a curve so fast she ended up sideswiping an oncoming vehicle who, that happened to be driven by their next door neighbor, Miss Pickering. Now, when you're 17, but nobody was hurt. The vehicles, though, were badly damaged. When you're 17 years old and you have your first accident, it scares you to death, right? You know that the punishment is going to be stiff and severe. So Anne says, I stayed away from home all day. When I came home that evening, she said, my objective was to tiptoe around everybody, get to my room as soon as possible. But she says, when I came through the kitchen door, there stood dad. She says, I froze for a moment. Then I ran over to him, threw my arms around his neck, began to cry, 
and said, Daddy, I wrecked the car today. I hit Miss Pickering. It wasn't her fault. It was all my fault. She says, I was sobbing on his shoulder, waiting to hear the verdict. She said, my dad said four things. Number one, he said, I already knew about the accident. Miss Pickering came straight up the mountain to tell me. But I was waiting till you were ready to tell me. Number two, he said, I love you. Number three, he said, we can fix the car. Number four, he said, Ann, this is going to make you a better driver. And that was it. Amazing grace. What a beautiful picture of how our heavenly Abba responds when we fail. Instead of thunder and lightning, there's grace and mercy coupled with a deep desire that we learn and grow through this experience. Are you living in relationship with Abba? Or are you living in a distant, fearful relationship with a king who above all else is an enforcer? Are you living religion or are you living the gospel of Jesus Christ? You want to know what's the difference between traditional religion and the gospel of Jesus Christ? A wise person once summed it up this way. Religion says, I messed up. My dad's going to kill me. The gospel says, I messed up. I need to call my dad. Are you living by religion or by the gospel? Jesus came bringing good news. When you screw up, you are not in the presence of an angry ruler who's going to rip your head off. You are in the presence of a loving Abba who wants to help you make it right and get on with your life. Which brings us to a second key point. If God relates to us as Abba, then that means God is merciful when I fail, number one. But it also means that nothing delights God more than seeing me grow into my full potential. Nothing makes a loving parent happier than seeing her child grow into the fullness of her potential, to stretch, to learn, to grow. No loving parent wants their child to stay weak and dependent. Every loving parent wants that child to, to grow, to strengthen, to find their courage, to live fully into life. One of my uh, favorite episodes of the Andy Griffith show is the one where Opie keeps losing his lunch money. Every morning, Aunt B or Opie give, or Aunt B or Andy give Opie a nickel so he can get milk at lunch. But he keeps asking for another nickel, saying he, he lost his nickel to the point that Andy gets suspicious that Opie is just trying to get more money out of them. Barney, for his part, being an ace detective, decides he's going to get to the bottom of this. In one scene, you, you see him as he's tailing Opie on his way to school one morning. You see him sitting on somebody's porch with a newspaper spread out in front of him. He's cut a hole out in the shape of his face and is watching Opie as he passes by. And sure enough, Barney gets to the bottom of it. He discovers that there's a bully that is intercepting Opie on the way to school and saying to him, give me your nickel or I'll give you a knuckle sandwich. Barney races back to the sheriff's station, reports this to Andy. Andy, he said, you're the, the, the law enforcer in this city. You're, in effect, the ruler of this town. You can make this right for your son. You should get this right for your son. And there was a part of Andy that wanted to fix this for Opie. But he hesitates because he knows if he keeps fixing everything for Opie, Opie will never grow into his fullness. And so he adopts a different approach. The next day, as Opie and Andy are fishing at their favorite fishing hole, Andy tells Opie a story about how when he was a kid and he first discovered this fishing hole, it's the best fishing hole in these whole parts. But then he said, a bully named Hody confronted me one day and said, this is my fishing hole. If you ever come back here again, I'm going to give you a knuckle sandwich. Now Andy had Opie's attention. Opie said, what happened, Pa? Andy said, well, I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't go back to the fishing hole. I was scared. 
But then, I didn't feel good about myself. So one day, I took my fishing pole and my tackle, and I went back to that fishing hole. What happened, Pa? Well, Hody was there. And when he saw me, he said, get out of here, I'm going to give you a knuckle sandwich. What happened, Pa? He hit me right in the nose. Did it hurt? Nope. I laughed. And I tore into him like a, a windmill in a tornado. What happened, Pa? Well, Andy says, we just been fishing here, ain't we? <laughs> Opie thought about this overnight. The next morning at home, before leaving for school, he says, are you sure it didn't hurt? <laughs> this time Andy doesn't answer him. He just picks up his young son and holds him tight. You can tell it's killing Andy. But he knows it's for the best. He puts him down. Opie's off to school. Andy's in the sheriff's station, and Barney's pacing back and forth. They are a nervous wreck. What's happening? Is he okay? Sure enough, the bully confronts him. Watch what happens. Another beautiful example of what it means for God to relate to us as Abba. You know, I know that in life we're going to confront so many bullies, some human, some circumstantial. And when we confront those bullies, I'm sure there are a million times when God would like to helicopter parent in vanquish our enemies and fix everything for us. Instead, though, how would we grow if God did that? So instead, God steps back. God supports, encourages, equips us like Andy in that episode, but then steps back and anxiously waits and then rejoices with us when we face down and triumph over the bullies of our life. That picture up there on the screen is a beautiful picture of how God feels about you when you stretch and grow, when you face your demons, when you face your bullies in the strength of God. God delights in you. But one last point. If God relates to me as Abba, that means, <clears throat> excuse me, that means, there we go, God is merciful when I fail, one. Two, nothing delights God more than seeing me grow into my full potential. And number three, God longs to be close to me. Like any loving parent longs to be close to their child, God longs to be close to me. And guess what? That makes God emotionally vulnerable. Ask any loving parent. When you love someone with all your heart, it makes you vulnerable because what if at some point they don't want to be close to you anymore? What if they've got other priorities? What if they drift away from you and then all you can do is wait and hope? and hurt. After dinner one night, um, Rodney uh, Hugan tells how he was having a conversation with his six-year-old son, Derek. Dad says to his son, Do you, tell me how you love me, Derek. Derek says, I love you a million dollars. Dad says, well, what about all the other dollars? Derek thinks about it for a second and says, I love you all the dollars. Dad says, well, what about the guilders? And then explains to him that guilders are Dutch dollars. Derek says, I love you all the guilders too. Dad says, what about the yen? Explains it's Japanese currency. I love you all the yen too. Then dad tells him about British pounds and says, do you love me all the pounds? He says his little boy patted him on the stomach and said, I think you already got all the pounds. <laughs> When little kids are small, they naturally want to be close to their parents. 
That relationship is a priority to them. But as they grow, there may come that point where they start to push away, where they've got other priorities, where they don't want to be close anymore. And all a loving parent can do is wait and hope that someday they'll want to be close again. Guess what? That's exactly how God feels about us as our loving Abba. Imagine the king of the cosmos hurting. Imagine the master of the universe unable to command the one thing God most wants, your love. So God waits and hurts. Let me close with this. In his book, The Man with Dirty Hands, Curtis Leans recounts an ancient Asian story that you'll recognize as having close parallels to Jesus' famous parable of the prodigal son. In the Asian version of the story, there is a young adult son of a wealthy father who falls in with some bad actors in his town who eventually persuade him to conspire with them to rob his father's treasury. But once the deed is done, these bad actors run away with the treasure, deserting the son who's now broken the trust of his father and worst of all, has brought shame and dishonor on the family name, the worst thing you could do in that ancient culture. Broken and deeply repentant, the son comes home and begs his father's forgiveness. The father summons all his family and friends to a great banquet to celebrate the homecoming of this wayward son. After everyone has had a, a full meal, the father stands at the head of the table, lifts his cup of rice wine to the sky to propose a toast to his son. After he speaks the toast, the son and all the guests at the banquet lift their cup of rice wine and drink deeply. After which, the son clutches his throat. His head falls forward, hits the table. Lifeless. Without batting an eye, the father, still standing at the head of the table, bows to his guests. The guests, without batting an eye, bow to the father, then quietly disperse. Things have now been set right. The family's honor is restored. You see, the father poisoned his wayward son. As you know, the end of Jesus' version of that story is dramatically different. Because in Jesus' story, the father is a loving Abba. A loving Abba is not focused on punishment, evening the score, vengeance. A loving Abba is just delighted that the child has come home and that the relationship can be close again. Maybe over the course of time, consciously or subconsciously, you've learned to think of God as being more like the Father in the non-Jesus version of that story. You've maybe learned to think of God as being the great punisher who's just waiting for you to get out of line to strike you down, and so you keep a safe distance. You're afraid. Today, Jesus invites us home. Let go of that old, primitive, one-dimensional understanding of God. Open yourself to the heart of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is that God is your heavenly Abba who delights in you and will never, 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 never stop loving you no matter what. So stop pushing away, and let God love you again. If you've been pushing God away, I invite you to 
to pray this prayer with me this morning. Abba, I'm going to stop being afraid of you. I'm going to stop believing the mischaracterizations that I've been taught. I'm going to dare to call you my Abba and believe that you love me like the best imaginable parent would. I'm going to delight in my relationship with you. I'm going to dare to draw close. Thank you for loving me. Show me the way. 